you're new here, we're going through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse. And just right off the bat, there'll probably be several disclaimers um, within the beginning part of my message, which will take about 45 minutes. Okay, the body of my message will be ab about another 90 minutes and my conclusion will be about 130 minutes, okay? Um, so we may be here when the new Jerusalem comes, comes down, when we, you know, from this, from this service. But right off the bat, okay, I am not a professional when it comes to the book of Revelation. I am a student. I am learning. Uh, I know we are all learning. And here's the other thing. I want to approach this book with a great amount of humility uh, because uh, brilliant, brilliant minds find themselves in disagreement concerning this text. My commitment is to find Jesus in the text, okay? This is not the book of Revelations. Nope, it's the book of Revelation. That means this is all about the revelation of King Jesus, okay? So my commitment is like to find Jesus, but just know this, that there might be times you disagree with me. It's okay. There are times that even Andrea disagrees with me, okay? Th there are times I even disagree with myself, okay? Um, so we do not demand uniformity in order to have unity, okay? Um, we, can, we, can, uh, we can agree on different things. Uh, there are some things that we're willing to fight for, bleed for, and die for, and that is that Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God, okay? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son to live, die, resurrect, ascend, okay? We believe that we are the, the church of Jesus Christ. This is the word of God, that we don't change it to affirm us, but we change to come into alignment with the word. Just say Amen. So we are in agreement on these things. And just so you know, we also have, you know, we have, we have different of op differences of opinions within our own leadership team, within our own eldership team, okay? And that doesn't make us weaker. That makes us, that makes us stronger, okay? We're bound together by the unity of love and the Father heart of God. Amen? Good. All right. With that being said, John finds himself caught up in the throne room of Yahweh for this incredible historic happening in the heavens. Um, John finds himself in the throne room just prior to the revealing of the Lamb. Okay, this is a big deal because he gets to, wor he gets to be a part of heavenly worship from created heavenly beings that are not human in origin. With that being said, he gets to see the enthronement of the Lamb and a succession, a moment of transition in the throne room. Now, there's a lot that is taking place here, but here's what's about to happen. There's about to be a revealing of Jesus as the Lamb, okay? He is about to be enthroned. He's about to sit down on his throne. And that's a big deal because that is going to be the inauguration of the kingdom that Jesus talked about. Wow. All right. Now, another disclaimer. Today, this is not milk. So if you haven't developed your, your spiritual and scissors yet, it's okay. If I talk about stuff and you don't know, you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Just, just say, Holy Spirit, I need you. And there'll be different things that pop in your spirit that come alive. And you'll say, wow, that's good. That's good. Um, but go along for the ride, okay? And, and there's going to be things that make sense. There's going to be things uh, that don't necessarily make sense. Um, but here is John, uh, and the, the lamb is about to be um, revealed, okay? And, and, and he's about to be uh, enthroned. And then uh, th there's going to be the, some, stuff that, some stuff that happens. Today we're going to be reading about the 144,000. Uh, we're, we're reading about the breaking of the seven seals, okay? And this is all a big deal. Why? Because this is a setup for a, for a war that's about to take place in the heavens. A war, yeah. Um, Yahweh is about to wage war in the heavens. Why? Because he is about to present to his son... A kingdom that is free and clear of all supernatural interference. Every principality and every power that has been influencing and dominating the earthly conversation is about to be judged. And not just supernatural powers, even earthly powers. 
there's going to be a judgment that comes upon uh, the Jewish um, uh, 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 system. There's about to be a judgment on the Roman system. But then there's going to be a, ju- a, a judgment on every earthly system. Okay? And if I could sum up the entire book of Revelation in one verse, it would be out of Psalm 110. Okay? You say, sum up the entire book? The entire book in, w- in one verse? Yep. Psalm 110 And the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Okay, so the father says to the son, sit at my right hand until what? Until I make your enemies your footstool. The father is going to give to his son a kingdom that is free and clear of all evil. This is going to be presented to the lamb. And the lamb is going to return. The marriage supper of the lamb. The restoration of all things. And the book ends the way that it begins. But far, far better. That's the book. So what do we have right now? We have the preparation of a war. Okay, the preparation in the heavenlies. Okay, in Revelation chapter 5, John sees a scroll. But there's no one worthy to open the scroll, and he, be, he begins to weep, saying there's no one worthy to, to receive the scroll. And then he hears a, a voice proclaim, behold, okay, the lion of the tribe. Okay, okay, this is awesome, okay. Um, there's no one worthy to receive the scroll. And then all of a sudden, behold, okay, the drums start, you know, the guitarists are like, you know, extra, extra heavenly distortion. It's like, it's heavy. (laughs) Okay, and and all the shofar players in heaven are like, which there's like 80, 100 of them. Okay, it's, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, and he turns to see the lion, and what does he see? He says, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he turns, he sees the lamb. And not just the lamb, but in the Greek, it's translated baby lamb, a lambkin. And not just a baby lamb, but a slain baby lamb. This is, behold, the lion of the tribe. And he turns and he sees Jesus. And Jesus receives the scroll. And he begins, okay, the scroll. What is this scroll? This is the Lamb's scroll. This is the Lamb's book. It's sealed by seven seals. The seals, that's not the content itself. The seals are like a wax seal, a seal by, by the ring of a king. Okay? And the reason why it's sealed shut is because this is a classified document. Okay? This is only intended for, for the eyes of one. The one who is worthy, the lamb. So he's about to break open seven various seals. And we were looking at this last week. And um, before we get to Revelation 7, in Revelation uh, chapter 6, um, when, it, when it gets to the, we were looking at the fifth seal last, last week, the fifth and sixth. In verse 9 it says, and he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. For they were the witnesses that had, that had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you uh, and will you judge and avenge our blood? Okay, the fifth seal. This is, this is, this is the crying out of, of the martyrs. These, these are those who, who testified of the coming of Yeshua and yet didn't necessarily get to see the fulfillment of their prophetic word within their lifetime. Okay? We also study the four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay? That was wild. That's one of the most terrifying um, scriptures in the, the Bible. Okay? The, the, the releasing of the, of the horsemen. The, the breaking of the seals. Why? Because the testimony of the Lamb is going to be open. Everything in the, in the heavens and on the earth had, had, had experienced a fracturing and a tearing because of rebellion against God, okay? Because of, of, of uh, Genesis chapter 3. It's the fall of, of mankind, okay? That's going to have implications. 
Now there in Genesis chapter 3, there's a prophetic word that through the seed of Eve would come forth, Messiah would come forth, the one who redeems, okay? And then you've got the prophetic era and all the prophets are declaring, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And they declared it, they waited. They didn't get to receive, um, uh, to get to see the fulfillment of their words. And here's the, the breaking of the fifth seal and it's the blood of the martyrs saying, is now, is now the time, is now the time of our ascension with the lamb. And the martyrs receive their white robes, okay? But, but not quite Yet, here's, here's the throne room. Here's the setup. It's the four horsemen who don't go to war yet. It's the four horsemen who, who are being summoned. The, the declaration is, come. And here comes the first horseman. The second declaration, come. Here comes the second horseman. Okay, conquest and, and, and bloodshed, right? And, and, and famine and pestilence, uh, um, inflation. And then finally, death, okay? The four horsemen, they're being bid, okay? In the throne room to come, present yourself. Okay, what's happening? It's the setup of the board. Okay, it's the setup of the cosmos. It's the setup of the war. The four, the four horsemen, the declaration of the martyrs, bid us come as well. You've welcomed the horsemen, bid us to come as well. You'll receive your robes, but not quite yet. Why? Because of the sixth seal and the 144,000. This is, this is the setup as God is, is, is about to wage war, okay, on principalities and powers to clear the map, to present, to present this glorious uh, uh, kingdom uh, to his son. That's Revelation as I read it. And not everybody may read it that way, okay? Good. I'm glad we had that settled. Revelation chapter 7, the 144,000. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Four corners? Yep. That's because the earth is flat. Holding back the four... <laughs> This is funny. We did, we did the Genesis series, and I did ancient he, uh, Hebrew cosmology. You guys remember that? And I, pres and I said, this is the way the ancients viewed the earth, okay? And a certain segment of people of Eden in person and online got really excited because they're like, yes, he is presenting earth the biblical way, okay? Flat earth, okay? And then later on in the series, I said, but we all know that the earth is a globe. And then there was, there, okay, Apparently there was like an uprising. There was this, this, people were really upset with me because they're like, what? Ah, oh, please, he sold out. <laughs> okay. Um, anyways, good times. Let's just keep reading. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, this is the way the ancients viewed the earth. Okay. The four corners of the earth and holding back the four winds of, of the earth. Okay. This, this is a look at mercy. So these judgments haven't been released on the earth yet. These angels are keeping things in place, okay? They're preparing everything for this escalation, this crescendo, okay? That no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Verse 2, and then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice, to the four angels who had been given a power, uh, uh, given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the four servants of our God on their foreheads. This is a seal. Okay, this is a marking of the righteous. Now, many people, uh, when, they, when they read the book of Revelation, okay, many people don't read the book of Revelation uh, because they're, they're just terrified of it and because all, it's just... They believe it's like the revelation of the Antichrist. How many of you have ever like, been like, have you ever read Revelation? Heck no. Why? That's the revelation of the Antichrist. That's like Mark of the Beast stuff. Delete your Starbucks app. Amen? All right, listen. No, this is the revelation of the Christ. So yes, there's a beast, okay? And we're going to study about the beast, and that's all good. But did you know that there's another marking? That yeah, the, 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 the mark of the beast, if you will, uh, uh, forehead and hand. But here we're going to see the, the marking, the sealing, uh, the sealing of the elect, okay? We, you, and I should be 
more obsessed with our suing of our foreheads and hand of our mind we have the mind of christ amen setting our thoughts on things that are ab- that are above okay what is this that's the that's the mind the marking of, of the head it's your identity okay it's also uh, it's also the marking on your hand which is symbolic of um, i should be able to look at your actions and see how your actions are in alignment with your thoughts okay um, this is thought and deed Okay, you know the righteous because of the mark. They've been marked, they've been sealed. Yes, but there is a corresponding reality for the righteous as they are living this out, right? So let's be obsessed over our own identity, our thoughts, our works. that They are lining up with Christ and, and let's not be so obsessed about, um, about the beast marking, okay? Um, so it says here, do not harm the earth or the seed of the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the seal, look at this, 144 thousand sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. What does your Bible say? Israel. Okay. Why? Because this is the 144,000 sealed from every tribe of Israel. Okay. I'm I'm just, okay, good. I'm glad. glad, Are we all in agreement? Okay, cool. Uh, Verse five. Now we're going to look at the accounting of the tribes. This is really cool. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Natali. 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon. 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar. 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun. 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. 12,000 from the tribe of Ben. Benjamin, they are sealed. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation. Just say every nation. From all tribes. Just declare all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hand and crying out with a loud voice, saying, salvation belongs to our God. I love this. This is the prayer of Jonah. Salvation is the Lord's. Amen. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Verse 11. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces uh, before the throne and worshiped God. Uh, uh, let me just hit pause on this. Uh, let me just insert. Uh, this is where we see the worship of the new creation in the throne room. Uh, up to this point, we have only seen um, uh, heavenly beings in the place of worship. So this is where we're beginning to see uh, a, a transition in the heavenlies from purely angelic exaltation to supernatural angelic exaltation, yes, but with the elect in Christ in the throne room together worshiping. Big deal, okay? This is pretty awesome. The cry of the angels is being adopted by the new, uh, by the one new man, which is really, really cool. All right. Uh, verse 12 saying, uh, amen, blessing. Look at the, 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 the declaration, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever Amen. Verse 13. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? Imagine being in the heavens. Imagine seeing this incredible scene and imagine this elder in the heavens saying to you, and who do you suppose that these are? Okay. Okay. (laughs) If if, if it were me, I'd be like, (laughs) not a clue, bro. You tell me, right? Like, whoa, who am I that you, you heavenly elder talk? Wow, isn't this just awesome? One of the elders looks over at John and says, and who might these be? Wow, okay, awesome. And he says, um, sir, <laughs> only you know, okay? And he said to me, these are the ones, look at this. He says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes 
and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat for the Lamb in the midst of their throne will be their shepherd. Isn't that awesome word choice? For the lamb will be their shepherd. Isn't that cool? The imagery here. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The reading of the word. Okay. Uh, amazing what is taking place here. Amazing what John is getting uh, to witness. Um, uh, before the enthronement of the Lamb, okay, before the enthronement of the Lamb, we see 24 what can be assumed to be supernatural beings in the thrones of the eldership, okay? They, upon the revelation of the Lamb, leave their thrones, remove their crowns, symbolic of a changing of authority, the changing of the heavenly guard, and then upon the enthronement of the Lamb, okay, we see the, the four horsemen come into the throne. We see the, the cries of the, of the martyrs, okay, and then we see the revelation of the 144,000, okay, and all of a sudden we begin to see the, the one new man represented in the heavens. All right. Now, um, when we're looking at this great setup, okay, um, we, have, we, we begin asking these, these various questions of who are the 144,000. I think I might have already given that away just from the reading of the text because believe it or not, there's a lot of different theories about who the 144,000 are, including one of the newer, more wild theories is that the 144,000 are, are, are aliens— which makes sense now because of all the stuff that you see on CNN and Fox News about the aliens, okay? Okay, the truth is out there, right? <laughs> you know, there's even this, uh, so you, 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 just so you know, ufology and AEPs and the integration of aliens and UFOs into the Bible Okay, um, that's, that doesn't work within our theology here at Eden, okay? So just take a deep breath, okay? And I'm sorry if I let some of you down who are trying to ask, when Jesus died on the cross, did he also die for those on other planets, okay? <laughs> okay? <laughs> all right, moving right along, all right? There's also this whole idea of simulation theory and the 144,000, okay? All kinds of, I told this to you recently that in my own study, okay, I've got a lot of commentaries that I've been reading uh, through this. And when it comes to taking the 144,000, when it comes to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, when you take these realities and you push them out into the future, you can't find any two parties who agree on any one specific application to the text. So um, immediately all, people begin saying, all right, it, it's, it's this generation and it was COVID-19, okay? Or it was, you know, I especially think of, of my grandparents' generation in the World War II and looking at Adolf Hitler and the atrocities um, with everything that took place there. It would be, I would want to take the book of Revelation and certainly say these are the seven years of tribulation. These are the four horsemen. I, I would want uh, to do that. The problem with taking what we've studied up to this point and applying it to a timeline in the future is that we will never agree on that application, okay? And the attempt to do so is pretty recent in that for a thousand years, okay, the early church fathers believed that the seven-year tribulation had already taken place, okay, with the destruction of the temple. This goes back to the—we studied this last week out of Matthew 23 and Matthew 24 when the disciples asked Jesus, when will the destruction of the temple come? Uh, they ask him about when will the, his kingdom be established in his coming. A lot of people think that that's talking about the second coming of Christ, but the disciples weren't aware of a second coming of Christ. Okay, so the, all, all the disciples were aware of was his first coming and the establishment of his kingdom. 
right? So this is actually speaking of his kingdom. So the early church fathers would look at a literal uh, application. It wasn't until 1908 when Cyrus Schofield, okay, created a study Bible called the Schofield Bible, in which laid out an eschatology composed of seven dispensations that go throughout the Bible. These were seven unique ways that God would deal and interact with humanity based on the various covenants that were, that were established there. So you almost see d seven different personalities of God in how he is relating with man throughout the, throughout the scriptures. Okay? The problem with the Schofield Bible and dispensationalism that was rolled out there was that Schofield was a cessationist. He did not believe in the spiritual gifts. Okay? He did not believe in fivefold ministry as being for the church today. And yet, it was the Pentecostals that really made this theology famous. We even look at like, guys that we, that we love and honor, like William Branham, who walked in such signs, wonders, and miracles, and yet was known for his eschatology, okay? not known really in a good way, but taking, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you got to stay in your lane. Right? So if your miracles are your thing, do miracles. You don't need to be the teaching pastor, right? William Branham walked in signs, wonders, miracles, but you didn't need to be teaching the Bible, right? But there were some of these greats, okay, that used the power of God to validate their theology. Listen, the power of God does not validate your theology. That's what the Catholic Church did. They used the power of God to validate their theology. So the Protestants, those who protest, okay, so this last week's kind of in our roots, okay? Protestant Christians, protesters, hallelujah. <laughs> okay. The Protestants rejected the power of God altogether because they said to the Catholic Church, if you're using your power to validate your bad theology, then we're, gonna, we're going to write off your power and your theology. Then the Protestant Ref Reformation, which led to the, the Great Reformation, led to a great adoption of the gospel and the scriptures, okay? But what did it cost them? It cost them the power of God because they told the Catholic Church, you can keep that. The whole healing the sick, the whole driving out demons. You can, very, very interesting when you look at church history. So when we look at who were the 144,000, according to uh, early church fathers, uh, I, um, Irenaeus, in this, uh, he's, he's church father, Irenaeus, this is the second century. Um, he wrote that the 144,000 were Jewish converts. Okay? Um, uh, Ecumenius was another one of our church fathers. He also wrote uh, that what happens in Revelation with 144,000 were Jewish converts, okay? Um, uh, Andrew of Caesarea, uh, 7th century. Um, I could, uh, Vic Victorinus, okay, 3rd century. Um, the 144,000, these are uh, Jewish converts in the 1st century. L they believed that the seven-year tribulation was the war where Rome surrounded Jerusalem. 20,000 Roman soldiers surrounded Jerusalem. You couldn't get in. Uh, you couldn't get out. They were literally starving the Jewish people. Uh, various reports give the death count on that. Over 1.1 million Jews lost their lives um, during this time. But what leads up to that literal tribulation? Revival in harvest. So you remember in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 converts are made. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, another 5,000 men believed in the Lord after a short time. Acts 21, verse 20, it says, Many thousands among the Jews believed and they were zealous for the law. What do we see? Okay, we see the impartation of the Holy Spirit and thousands upon thousands of Jews are giving their lives to Yeshua. They are believers in Yeshua. So many of the early church fathers believed that the 144,000, okay, that these were Jewish converts during uh, the first century. And you say, well, why were they counted? Why when it says the Jewish people it is counted with such detail. But then when we get in, into the Gentiles and everybody else in heaven, it just says they couldn't be counted. Just there were scores and scores of them. 
According to the Old Testament, you see this with Moses in Numbers chapter 1 and chapter 2. You see this again in Numbers chapter 26 with Moses, that any man over the age of 20 that could be drafted to be a part of the army, they were counted. Okay? The reason why this is captured here is there is a militancy in the language, in the capture, in the capturing of this data. Uh, same thing with uh, David in First Chronicles chapter 12. There's a detailed accounting of any male that could be used to be a part of the army. So what is taking place here? We see in the heavens with the breaking of these seals, the blood of the martyrs, we're going to see all of these Gentiles and the detailed accounting of the number of Jews who came to know Yeshua as king. And what's, 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 what's Yahweh doing? He is building an army and not just an army. It's a sealed army. In the same way, in Ezekiel chapter 9, the judgment of God is about to be released, and there's going to be a sealing, uh, a marking, so that anybody who's marked, that they will not have to suffer the judgments of God. In the same way, uh, the Israelites underneath uh, uh, Pharaoh, right, they were instructed to seal their homes with the blood of the Lamb, okay, and the judgment of God, the angel of death, would fly over their homes. What we see is a priestly marking over these homes, a priestly marking, a marking of sacrifice on the lives of these individuals. The Lord is building an army within this text, and not just an army. This is an army of priests that since the beginning, all he has ever wanted was a home. And since the beginning, this was the call of humanity that we would be a priesthood. Revelation is the accounting that because of what the Lamb has done, there is going to be a great restoration of God's original plan that he would have a home. There would be no division between heaven and earth. There would be a people and not just a people, okay? Not just a bunch of humans, okay? Where can I find a good place to go on a Sunday, right? Do you have good coffee? <laughs> you know, do you have good worship, right? Do you have a good sermon for me? Okay, that was not a part of God's original. Okay, I'm no longer being fed. Let's go over here. Okay. I need a place where I can go on Sunday, go to church and do math, okay? And, and you don't make me happy anymore. Let's go to this church, right, 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 okay? This is, not, this is not what God had in mind when he said, let there be light. When he said, be fruitful and multiply, okay? Subdue the earth, take dominion over the earth. There is more to life than funding your 401k being moral, voting Republican, and hoping for dear life that when you die, you go to heaven. There is more to life. And this is what the book of Revelation does. It inspires us. It awakens us. You see, when I read this historically, then all of a sudden I see, oh wow, I can read the Bible through the lenses of kingdom theology, which is, which is what? Kingdom theology says that Jesus, when he was teaching all the time, he was always teaching on the gospel of the kingdom. He's always saying the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's very, very small, but over time, it's growing. Uh, Jesus would say the kingdom of God is like a little bit of leaven, okay? And a little bit of leaven affects, affects the whole, okay? He's, he's, he's giving his church a theology for how to position us. We should plan on being around a while and we should plan on being a part of this kingdom that is advancing. My friend, the kingdom of God is advancing. It is advancing from people group to people group, from city to city and nation to nation. The question is not there's a tribulation coming. Is God going to rapture us out before? Okay, before the tribulation? Or is he going to rapture us out in the middle? of the tribulation? Or is he going to rapture us out at the end of the tribulation? You know, and, and, and that would be something. To go through the whole tribulation and be like, I'm still standing. Yeah, get, get beamed up. No, 
And for that reason, you won't find the word rapture anywhere in the book of Revelation. When you read this thing historically, you'll say, hallelujah, look at what the early church did. Look at those that, that went through this time. Look at the prophecy of Jesus that an eon, an age, would come to, the, to an end. An old covenant would come to an end. A new covenant would begin. And the Lamb would be seated on the throne, ushering in, inaugurating the beginning of the the kingdom of God. We are a part of this kingdom age. And all of a sudden it gives you lenses to read your entire Bible that we do not have a God with multiple personalities. It's not he was angry then, but he's happy now. He's consistent in his morality. He's consistent in his character. He's consistent in his nature. He's consistent in his love and his uh Perfection. This is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That the end, these glimpses, you know, when we were looking at this in, in Revelation uh, chapter 7, it says, um, uh, verse 16, okay, it's this whole scene. And then there's this forecasting. There's this looking out. And they shall hunger no more. The sun will not affect them. Scorching heat. For the lamb is in the midst of them. He's going to wipe away their every tear. This is, this is end word choice. Okay. We're going to read about the first trumpet that is sounded. Okay. And this, this, these trumpets, they work. They are a part of this whole existing uh, scene. And, and th when we're reading, there's going to be these. Have you ever heard of a flashback? Something traumatic happens and, and, and you flash and you flash back to the trauma. Revelation gives us flash forwards. A flashback, you flash back to the trauma of the past. But a flash forward, it flashes you to the restoration of all things. When you're reading the text here, all of a sudden we read terminology that, that flashes us. And when we read about the first trumpet sounding, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to take us to the very end, to the restoration of all things. And so, listen, some, some people would say, I love Eden. I love the sweatshirts. Okay. I love the hats. And I, I agree. We need to get back to Eden. And you know what I tell them? No. Wrong. There is no going back to Eden. Because restoration does not mean you're going back. Restoration means you're moving forward. The Lord spoke to me one time, believe it or not. <laughs> and, he, and he said to me, um, he was talking to me about this house. That he's going to restore this house. He's going to restore this church. And I immediately thought of a, a, a rewinding back to like the good old days. You understand? He said to me, you don't even understand. You don't even know my definition of the word restoration. When I tell you I'm going to restore this place, I'm going to restore it into a state and status it has never been before. Listen, when the Lord restores something, he does not come to fix it. Okay? In the kingdom, there's no rewinding. In the kingdom, there is just the revelation of the restoration of all things. When all of the cosmos has been born again because of the unrolling of the scroll that engulfs all things. All things that, were, that, that fell because of sin and rebellion against God. When the, when the reality of the unfolding grace of God because of the lamb that was slain engulfs everything. We are going to know a restoration that, that, that the past has no record of. But you don't have to wait to receive of that grace. And that's what it is. That grace is a tasting of the age that is to come. Grace is a receiving of the future restoration of all things into the present. Grace doesn't mean that God has to put up with you, okay? Amazing grace. I love that song, okay? But that saved a wretch like me. That saved a worm like me. That saved a sinner like me. I'm just a sinner. So that's what I do. I, I sin because sinners sin. So that's what I do. I sin. So I'm just going to sin. <laughs> like, no, bad theology. Bad, bad, bad. Okay? 
He who knew no sin became all of your sin so you could become the righteousness of Christ. If you're righteous, you do righteous things. So you, you don't do sin anymore because you're not a sinner anymore. That's who you was. That's not who you is. I'm glad we had this conversation. I'm just, a pro, I'm just you know, depraved. I'm just depressed. No, that you was nailed to the cross. It is no longer you who live. Careful what you call yourself. I am a Christian because I am in Christ. There's no depravity in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we receive of his grace, we taste of the restoration of all things. When you lay hands on the sick and they recover, when those blind eyes see, every eye will see. Every tongue will rejoice. Every knee will bow. When you lead your neighbor to the Lord and they fall on their knees and they lift up their hands and they say, Jesus is Lord. That is the future restoration of all things invading the present. And that's what we are called to do as ambassadors, as diplomats, as an army of priests. He's building. He's building his, his, his kingdom, his advancing kingdom. Little by little, moment by moment, we are pushing forward. We're not retreating. We don't have retreat theology. We have advancement theology. We are advancing his kingdom. We can only do so much. We're going to need to see, okay? How many of you, you feel like, man, I feel like I'm in the middle of a war. Yeah, it's talked about right here. Man, I feel like there's principalities of power. Man, I'm feeling a little bit buffeted. Yeah, it's right here, okay? These things don't have final authority over us. Okay, we have final authority in Christ, but there's still a buffeting. There's still people that are giving their lives for the gospel, okay? There's still people that, you know, got all of this going on, okay? We will advance. We will move forward, but that time will come when every principality and power, every devil will come underneath the justice of King. The time will come, okay, when, the, when, we, when there will be no more tears. There will be no more grieving. There will be no more war. There will be no more famine, okay, and this will be, this will be because of the justice of King Jesus. It will be because that he, in order to bring restoration, okay, there has to be a deputizing and a, and a bashing. And, and, and a reconciling against these forces of evil. Hallelujah. The reckoning is coming. We join with all creation saying, come, Lord Jesus. He, he, the Father is going to give his Son a kingdom and all of his enemies will have been subdued under his feet. All of his enemies will be his footstool. That is the kingdom that Jesus will receive from his Father. That is the book of Revelation. This is this glorious picture. And, and, and much, much, this is a piece, okay? And much, 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 much more. I, I give thanks to the countless men and women who have studied the scriptures to bring forth their peace to this incredible uh, book of, of Revelation, their, their understanding. Isn't it awesome that we get to be a part of of, of, of hundreds of years, of thousands of years of church history, of people that, that dove into the Word of God, okay, and, and said, this is my understanding, and this is what the Holy Spirit is on. And, and then we get access to it all. We don't even have to go to the library. We can just get it right on our phone. We get to read the origin. We get to read all these church fathers. And isn't that amazing? For such a time as this, we are a part of the victorious, advancing kingdom of God. Let's stand together. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's what we all have in common today is that we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's perfection. At the end of the day, our own righteousness does not save us. We are all in need of a good shepherd. We are all in need of a savior. 
The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're a whosoever, and so am I. When you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he will be faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and to break the power of sin within your life. And then he will give you his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to indwell inside of you, to convict you of sin, and to enable you to do the things of the kingdom, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, for freely you've received, and freely you'll give what you have received. I want to lead us in a prayer. Let's all pray this uh, together, and let's rejoice in knowing that people are stepping out of the lie of orphanism and stepping Stepping into the kingdom as sons and daughters and, and, and inheritors. Let's pray this together. Just say, Jesus, I believe in my heart. I speak it with my mouth. I believe you died on the cross for all of my sins. I believe you rose from the grave on the third day. I believe that you ascended. I believe that you are seated on the throne where you intercede for me. I believe you've given me your spirit, the Holy Spirit, to indwell within me. I believe this in my heart. I confess this with my mouth. And now, Father, I invite your world to be a part of my world. I surrender my world to you. If you prayed that prayer today, I want to invite you into the family of God. You're no longer an outsider. You're an insider. When you mess up, when you sin, don't run away from God. Run back to Him. He will always have His fatherly arms open to you. Expect to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Expect to be growing little by little, day by day. Expect transformation of His Spirit within you and expect to see the goodness of God released through you. I declare this morning, you are loved by your Creator God and you've been saved by His grace. I call you blessed this morning. God bless you. I want to invite you back tonight as we do our Fight for Life uh, night. It's going to be good. Tomorrow marks the two-year anniversary of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. So we're going to be talking tonight about this, 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 this fight for life, what's taking place in our nation and the nations at 6 o'clock. If you're new here, um, I will be in the hallway after this service. I'd love to meet you. Uh, I've got a gift for you. This is a copy of my book. So I'll give you a high five, get you hooked up with the book. Uh, that'll be good. Um, can I have our prayer ministry team come? If you need prayer this morning, prayer for anything. You might need healing or encouragement. Uh, don't feel like you have to leave. We, we've got time. So we just invite you to come to the front. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to stand with you. You're not alone this morning. Call you blessed. Thanks for being a part of our Eden service this morning. Love you.